My name is Leo and I am 10 years old and I have got a visually impairment but that's not all you need to know about me. <laughs> I've never actually met or had a conversation with a visually impaired adult, so I'd really like to meet one. I heard about a man called David Blunkett, who used to be a politician, so we're going up to Sheffield to meet him. I could see light and dark. I think you can see a little bit, can't you, Leo? Yeah, I can see a little bit. Yeah, I can only see uh, very bright light. Say, say the sun is shining through a window and I walk into a room and I, I can focus and think, ah, oh, there's the window. But I sometimes get it wrong. I'll say to my wife, Margaret, Margaret, is that the sun? And she'll say, no, it's a very bright light. <laughs> so one's switched on. Uh, and I'll say, oh, well, never mind. And sometimes I go to switch the light off when I'm in a room and discover that I've not had the light on at all. So sometimes what I think I can see, I can't actually see, but it helps just to focus a little bit sometimes, doesn't it? If you can see where a window is. What causes your, your visual impairment? Well, it took a long time for them to realise what was wrong because when I was first born, there was no obvious reason that I couldn't see because my eyes weren't disfigured. But years later, it was realised that this was just one in a million chance uh, that my optic nerve didn't develop. And the optic nerve is that little nerve behind the eye that connects things up. Why? Did you become a politician? Well, I was brought up on a council estate in the north of Sheffield, and my mum had had a really, really rough time health-wise, and my dad was involved in a terrible accident at work when I was 12 and died after a month in hospital. And my granddad, who was very frail, lived with us, and he ended up in a very, very poor, decrepit hospital for elder people, for older people. And I thought, I've got to do something to change the world for the better. I want to make this a better place in which to live. I want to overcome some of these dangers and some of this inequality and injustice. Do you wish you were sighted? Oh, I think that's a really difficult question because the true answer is yes. I, I've always believed that it would be really nice if I could see. But it do, doesn't mean that I go around thinking, oh dear, oh dear, I can't see, so there's nothing I can do and isn't it a miserable life. There are some people who say, oh well, I, I, I'm blind and I really wouldn't want to see. I don't quite understand that because I'd love to be able to see a vision of my wife and children, I'd love to be able to see wonderful paintings. I'd love, above all, to be able to stand on a hill and see the countryside. But you adapt. You know, I get uh, people to describe to me the sun uh, playing on the woodland out in Derbyshire, where I walk, uh, the, the rivers running below, uh, the way in which the birds are flying, uh, the colours that people can see. I get people to describe that and then I make a mental picture of it myself. And then I feel the sun on my face and the breeze in my hair and I smell the vegetation and the herbs and the flowers and I think life is really very good. So I use other ways of seeing rather than actually being able to see through my eyes. And I suspect that you do that as well, don't you, Leo? Feel forward and you feel Bali, okay? Yeah. Can you feel him? Now, on his back is a handle and the handle is attached to a harness. 
and the harness is fixed round his chest. Can you feel that? Yeah. Feel the leather there? Yeah. And when I hold the handle, yeah. Bali knows he's working. And he will then guide me round obstacles, make sure I don't fall down steps or down a hole, get me around lampposts. Not very bouncy barley. Bouncy barley. Yes, bouncy barley. Bouncy barley. Way back, this was my school. At the age of four, I came with my mum and dad up Manchester Road, dropped off the bus at the bottom of the road, came through the gates, no idea what I was coming to, and here it was, the school for the blind. When we first got here, when I was only four, lots of the children were naturally very upset and homesick, and the funny thing is, my mum said she wasn't allowed to come with me once we'd signed in. And she watched, and there was a little boy crying, and. She, this, I don't know wh whether this was me being an early politician, but she said I went up and took his hand and said, don't worry, I'll look after you. And I was only four at the time. And I thought, well, blimey, a politician in the making there. <laughs> Have you got any advice for me? Never take no for an answer. The second is believe in yourself. The third is you're going to get knocks in life. You have to pick yourself up, brush yourself down, grimace, grin and get on with it. Be as understanding about other people as you can be. I wasn't always, so I'm telling you to do what I didn't always do, which is sometimes people are fearful about difference, about you not being able to see. Sometimes they're ignorant and stupid. Sometimes they mean well, but they get it wrong. You stood at the edge of a pavement wanting to wait for somebody or wait for a bus and they'll come along grab your arm and try and take you across the road mm. and instead of saying leave me alone you have to say that was very nice of you to try and help but actually on this occasion I'd like to just wait here if you don't mind or something like that okay so that's the fifth piece of advice be really nice when you'd really like to be very angry okay It was really interesting to meet David Blunkett and I realised that visually impaired people can do anything that anyone else can do. Visually impaired people just want to be treated like everyone 